Good morning. I am um, especially grateful this morning to be here. Um, I, as my first day, uh, as pa- I'm a little extra nervous today. I was just talking to Ryan and Hope last night about not being nervous. I'm nervous today. Um, but I'm so grateful for you guys bringing me on board, um, for just giving me the opportunity uh, to be pastor of uh, First Baptist Church Del Rio. I'm grateful and honored, and um, wow. We're <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, Got to get a hold of myself a little bit. Uh, we are still in First Peter, and we're in chapter 2 today. Um, I'm excited about what the Lord is doing and what he's preparing. And as we look at our lives in the, in the last few years, even in the last few months, we can, we can see God orchestrating and, and being sovereign over everything and just how he has prepared us and you guys, I think, for something great. I'm expecting something great. I'm expecting us to reach this community for Christ. And, and I'm thrilled to be a part of it. But it's going to take all of us. It's going to take all of us to... We'll, we'll get into what Peter is talking about. Proclaiming these great excellencies of Christ. It's up to all of us to go and tell people about this great Jesus that we serve. And I'm excited. Um, I'm shaking. I don't have my boots on today. I've got my converse. But I'm shaking in my converse right now. I'm so excited. And, um, and just to be a part of it. Honored to be a part of it. Um, pray with me this morning. Pray for me this morning. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for the opportunity, Lord, that you have given us to be a part of this mission, that you um, are giving us broken people just the opportunity to represent you, Lord, and to go and tell people about Jesus. We thank you, Lord. I ask that you would give us wisdom, that you would give us discernment, Lord, that you would give us um, the right words to communicate, the right situations, Lord, that we may be able to recognize situations in which we can bring your name to the conversation and say, look at my Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for the honor of being your servants, God. We love and we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. So last week we were in First Peter uh, chapter one verses seventeen through twenty five. We wrapped that up, and um, and just to to review what we were talking about there is uh, Peter is telling us that we need to be careful in our conduct. We need to be careful in how we carry ourselves because people are are watching us, and um, and then he reminds us that we have been ransomed. He has paid a price for us. Jesus has paid a price for us. And so that should be very real in our life, and we should keep it in mind always as we go out into the world and represent him. Because it's only through him. Again, Peter continues there in that section, and he says, it's only through him that we are believers. He caused it. He has uh, done a work in our lives to prepare us to uh, hear a, a prepared message that someone else has given, and he has set these two things up so that we may come to faith. And so um, Peter continues, having purified your souls, and in, in, uh, again in chapter 1, verse 22, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love. We are to disp- display sincere brotherly love to each other because folks that need Jesus will recognize that. A sincere brotherly love. And it'll speak volumes to those that 
are, are seeking, those that want answers, those that are hurting, and see how we deal with the everyday life problems. And how we love, how we take care of each other, will stand out. So we move into um, 1 Peter chapter 2. A living stone and a holy people is the title of um, our message today. Verse 1, So put away all malice, all deceit, and hypocrisy, and envy, and all slander. These things in our life need to be destroyed. They need to be done away with. Like newborn infants, long desire for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation. Going back to, first, to the first uh, verse. Malice. Just to review, you all may know the definitions of these words, but just for those of us that may not. Malice. A desire to hurt someone with words or deeds. Guile. A desire to gain some advantage or preserve some position by deceiving others. Hypocrisy, a desire not to be known for what really is. Envy, a desire for some privilege or benefit that belongs to another. And slander, the desire for revenge, a self-enhancement, often driven by the deeper desire to deflect attention from self. James warns us about our speech, about our tongue. And Peter in the last chapter was talking about our conduct. There is a higher standard for us. If we're going to be saying that we're Christian, now we, I, I revisit that phrase often. If we are going to call him Lord, if we are going to say that we are his servants, if we are representing him, then the standard is pretty high. Right near impossible, honestly. But the standard is still high. The standard is Jesus. And so our task is impossible without Jesus, without his Holy Spirit giving us direction, giving us discernment, and giving us understanding, and then the strength to carry through with that proper conduct, with that standard. And so putting those things aside, did you hear about so-and-so? Well, I don't behave that way. Did you hear what he said? Oh, my. All of these things are to be set aside. And we should long, we should desire, we should want. How does a newborn want milk? Anybody have kids? Or has had kids? Two or three in the morning? Feeding times? Two, three, four, five? in the morning, feeding times. Nobody else is getting any rest if that baby is not fed. Like that. Like that, Peter is saying. Desire. Long for. What are we to long for? It says, like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation, his word. We should want to get to know the Lord better. We should desire, and the means to know him is through his word. And should, we should be thirsty on a regular basis to want more of him. And that's what Peter is saying. That's how we replace malice and deceit and hypocrisy and envy and slander. 
We have to fill the void that those things in our life leave, and we replace it with that longing for that spiritual milk. Because it brings us closer to our Savior. It's not, again, we talked about this last week, or two, two weeks ago, about it's the beginning of the week, and I'm determined to have a good week, and I'm not, I'm not going to, you know, deceive or, or be a hypocrite or, or mal... It's not like that. It's through him that we can do it, and only through him. If we neglect our relationship with the Lord, we're back to chapter one, going back to our old ways and handling things in our own way. There's a, um, a song based on Psalm 42. It says, As the deer panteth for the water, so my soul longeth after thee. Does that describe your Christian walk? I come short of that, honestly. There are the, the, these um, ebbs and flows of my really. There's, there's times that I do. I, Lord, I need you. I need you. I need you. This morning, before I got started, was one of those. And then there's other times that things are going so easy. It just... I'm not running away from him, but it's just like we're just in the flow. As the deer panteth for the water, so my soul longeth after thee. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. That's what Peter is getting at. There should be a thirst. There should be a hunger for that spiritual milk. There is no satisfaction anywhere else except there. Verse 3. I I read a few commentaries on this verse, and um, it says, If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. And it kind of leaves, that, that version leaves a question, if you have indeed. And other versions, I think the NIV says, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. It honestly does not matter. What matters here is the tasting. The, the tasting makes the difference. If we have tasted, there will be longing for that spiritual milk. Because it gives us a better understanding of who our Savior is. And our relationship with him and our position. And we get to know really how deprived we have been. And how much we need him from one moment to the next. Verse 4, as you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house. To be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices. Spiritual sacrifices, what does that mean? We offer our body, right? The Bible talks about we offer our body as a living sacrifice. We say to the Lord, here I am in all my beings, you know, my soul, my body, everything, Lord, however you want to use it. Spiritual sacrifice. Our offer of praise is another spiritual sacrifice. We sing and we worship. We make a joyful noise as a spiritual sacrifice. 
We offer help. Again, I, I like the book of James a lot because there's this practical aspect to that book that um, he says, I think it's uh, in, in chapter two that he says, oh, you believe? You believe in this creator? You believe in this God? Really? Even the demons believe and they shudder. They shake at the mention of his name. And then he goes into how we are to work out our salvation. So there's clear evidence all through the scriptures that say just proclaiming, right? I believe. That's not enough because even the, the demons believe and they're condemned. So what that points to is a transformation. What that points to is that we ought to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, the only way that we can be saved is through this living stone that has been rejected by men. Verse 5, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to obey, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices, accepted, acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Again, continuing in this uh, spiritual sacrifices, our help to men, very practical ways that we can help folks and then deliver the gospel, right? We proclaim, and in practical ways, we reach out. It gives us an open door. And then, like Stephen, he was just in charge of distributing food in the, in the New Testament. And he got stoned for being a faithful servant of the Lord. He was in charge of food. How do you feel about that, Galindos? <laughs> no, but listen, he was grounded. He was a preacher. And he proclaimed it in front of those that were persecuting him, and he did not back down. Paul, Saul at the time, was witness to that and held their coats, those that were going to stone Stephen, and he saw it happen. Because he was a faithful servant. He, was, he died a martyr's death. So another spiritual sacrifice. Willing to die for what we claim. And it's acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. It's not... Like we're earning our salvation through these actions. It's not like if I do more of this, or if I die a martyr's death, that, um, that I've earned my way to heaven, to eternity with my Lord. It's a fruit of what we have claimed. That's what it comes down to. If there is no fruit, there may not be any salvation. But sometimes... There are nice people that do nice things, but that may be all that it comes down to if there is no proclaiming of the word, if there is no pointing to Jesus. Verse 6, for it stands in Scripture, behold, I am laying in Zion, a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So, the honor is for you who believe. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The firm foundation for this thing that we call Christianity is Jesus. He was rejected. But from that rejection, man, comes this. We see through the book of Acts, people had, 
Peter uses this word exiles. People had to flee from where the church first got started. But at the same time, that, that fleeing, that, that running away from this center point spread the gospel. That's why we have it. That's why we have the Bible. That's why we have Christianity here, because they had to run away. Isn't that amazing? How the Lord works. We get to be participants of this family because they had to run away. And it's on a firm foundation, this cornerstone. Verse 8, And the stone of stumbling and a rock of offense for those that don't believe. If we, if we listen to sometimes what's going on in the news, what's going on around the world, people are offended by what this says. Oh, you bigots. Haters. It's been prophesied. It's been foretold that this will not sit well with the world. And we see it. It is evident. They stumble because they disobey the word. As they were destined to do. He was rejected. Be willing to do the same. Verse 9. But you... Them, these churches that Peter was talking to, and us. You. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. We belong to him. Why do we belong to him? that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you. So we can go and tell people about him and how great he is and how he has worked in our life. How faithful, how loving, how merciful our Lord is. Go and proclaim it, Peter says. You have been saved so that you can go and tell others. Excellencies. Just how awesome our Lord is. The excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You were walking around blind. And he has given us light. So after all of this, right? After all of this that Peter has laid out, he says, go and proclaim. And and Jesus says the same thing. Go and make disciples. Go. Don't sit and wait. Don't wait for them to come to you. Go. Once, this is, this is why Peter is saying, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. But once, verse 10, you were not a people. But now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Because we have received mercy from him. Because we have been forgiven for much. We are expected to tell people, those that are lost need to hear from him. And they will hear 
through us. Long for that spiritual milk. As we read his word and as we get to know our God, there should be a continued growth, a continued passion in our life to go and save people. Not us, but as we deliver this great news from the Lord, he will do the work. He will do the transformation. Just like when we heard we were primed and ready. He had worked in us in such a way that when we heard it, we accepted it. And we prayed and we asked for forgiveness and we recognized how wretched we were. And so in the same way, we reach out to those that are lost. Paul in Ephesians, the first chapter Verses 15 through 19. This is Paul praying for Ephesus, for the church in Ephesus. He's giving thanksgiving, but he's also laying out a prayer. And he says, For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you. I continue to pray for you and just give thanks to the Lord for you. Remembering you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom. Now this is a church. These aren't people that are lost. These aren't people that he's trying to reach out to, that he's trying to convert. These are, this is an established church. And he's saying, I pray daily. I pray all the time. I remember you guys all the time. And I pray that the Lord would give you wisdom. The spirit of wisdom and of revelation that he can open your eyes and that you can see his glory. And that it, that it may wake up a passion in you, a desire, a longing to go and tell. A spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened. These are believers. And he is saying, Lord, open their eyes. That you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. Us. Lord, open our eyes. When we fall short of knowing you, God, reveal yourself to us so that we can recognize your glory and go and tell people about you. That's what Paul is saying here in, in Ephesians. Having the eyes Verse 18, having the eyes of our hearts enlightened that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might? that we can understand this glorious, glorious inheritance. What it is that we are actually going to get and what we get while we still remain here. And Paul is saying, man, I pray that we could understand, that you guys can understand just how awesome this is. according to the working of his great might. So, having covered all this, we go back to verse 9 in Peter. In um, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. 
that you may proclaim. Having known all this, we talked about it. Now what? Proclaim. Let it be known. Do we realize how? How much of an honor we have here to be participants. I want to run down there and in what position we have been placed that we get to, that we get to proclaim these truths. I heard a little bit of an amen there. That is awesome. That keeps me going. We get to, we get to, watch out, we get to participate in this. He has given us the opportunity to Participate in this. That's great. Lord, we thank you. We thank you, God, for for that honor to be able to proclaim your truth. To tell people about our Jesus. God, forgive us when we mess it up. We don't always get it right. God, but that we may be humble enough to recognize and go back to you and ask for forgiveness and ask for direction and ask for wisdom so that we can continue to proclaim these truths. You are a great and awesome God and we thank you for being in our life, and for giving us the opportunity to participate, Lord, in this kingdom work. We love you, God. We worship you. In Jesus' name, amen.